ಮಹಾದೇವ ಶಿವ ಶಂಭೋ ಮಹಾದೇವ ಶಿವ ಶಂಭೋ ಮಾರಕೋಟಿ ಸುಂದರ ಪ್ರಭೋ ಶ್ರೀ ಮಹಾದೇವ ಶಿವ Every year we celebrate Shivratri with fervor and gaiety. It is a night full of piety. It is a night full of singing devotional songs and chanting the name of Shiva. A night full of awakening, celebrating and understanding the concept of Shiva Tattva. It is one of the holiest of festivals celebrated by Hindus all over. Have you paused to wonder why we celebrate Shivratri and why do we celebrate it as the night of Shiva? Who is the Shiva? Indian thoughts and practices over time immemorial have commemorated certain days and festivals as ways and means for people to understand and reunite with the universe and the divinities in the universe. These festivals become gateways for people to reach out and be in communion with these forces. Shivaratri is one such festival for people to reach out and be in communion with the divinity called Shiva. To understand the concept of Shiva also known as Shiva Tattva. It is not a night of Shiva but a night with Shiva. What does the word Shiva mean? The word Shiva simply means mangalam or auspicious anything that's auspicious is shiva this is evident from the way the people greet each other the traditional way of wishing one another was through the phrase shivaste pantanaha meaning let your ways be auspicious your paths your deeds and your ways of life be auspicious shiva is potential shiva is life shiva is sh e va anything with shiva is with life and anything without shiva is without life or shava shavasana means lying still or lifeless so shiva is auspicious shiva is potential shiva is life shiva is all encompassing Realizing this Shiva Tattva is Ananda, bliss. You may ask, why is this festival celebrated as a night-long festival and not a day festival? To answer this question, we must first understand the meaning of the word Ratri or night and the role of Ratri. The word Ratri means comfort giver. Ratri is that which gives one comfort or rest from three types of activities. kaika bodily actions vachika speech manasika thoughts a person is also capable of thinking at three levels adhyatmika thinking of the stula gross matter self adi bhautika thinking of the physical sciences and nature around adi daivika thinking of the subtle During the night when a person sleeps it is a restful state for all activities of body and mind hence night is called ratri or comfort giver what a beautiful way to name something such that its very name implies its meaning and function it is only during the night of any being that the being gets rejuvenated and refreshed for the next cycle For man this natural rhythm is daily day and night every night the body gets regenerated and refreshed for the next day the old cells are discarded and get replaced with new cells every day blood in the body is purified and circulated every day new blood cells are born each day what does this night and regeneration concept have to do with shiva shiva is the divinity for dissolution and regeneration 
for only if there is dissolution is there scope for regeneration for the new. This continuous cycle of dissolution and regeneration is called pralaya. Pralaya is limitedly understood as one big flood that washes away everything or fire engulfing everything. Laya means to merge or dissolve into. Music that makes one forget everything and makes one blend with the music is said to have layam. Pralaya simply means a special dissolution where things merge back into their ultimate natural form. It is just not a big flood that washes away everything. In fact, there are four types of pralaya defined in ancient Indian texts. Nitya pralaya or daily pralaya like the night for man. Naimitaka pralaya or occasional pralaya such as floods, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, tsunamis. Avantara pralaya or periodic pralaya like the seasons or ice ages. Maha pralaya or the great pralaya where everything merges back to where it came from. Every pralaya thus denotes a rhythmic process of dissolution after which starts a regeneration. Thus, it is a period of tranquility when all bodies are calm and preparing for regeneration. Following this tranquility is the joy and celebration which comes with having been regenerated and refreshed. Shiva is associated with regeneration. Before regeneration comes dissolution or the meltdown of anything. Therefore, to rejuvenate ourselves and become ready to go through another year in the cycle of our earthly life, we first need to dissolve ourselves and merge with the cosmic rhythm denoted by Shiva and his Damaru. From time immemorial, our ancestors have given this night of regeneration a feeling of serenity through fasting and praying, followed by celebration with singing. Why is this Shivaratri called Mahashivaratri or the Great Shivaratri? Does that mean that there are other Shivaratris too? There are two types of Shivaratri festivals that we celebrate. One is Mahashivaratri that we celebrate annually in the lunar month of Magha on the Krishna Paksha Chaturdasi night. That is, the night before Amavasya, new moon in the month of Magha, which now occurs in the month of February, March. The other, not so well known, is the monthly celebration of Shivaratri, which falls on the Krishna Paksha Chaturdasi every month or the night preceding the monthly Amavasya new moon. The next question will then be, why do we celebrate both a monthly Shivaratri and an annual Shivaratri? The initiated and self-realized try to unite themselves with this rhythm and regenerate themselves once a month on the monthly Shivaratri. The annual Mahashivaratri provides the common man an opportunity to experience and synchronize himself with this rhythm and experience Shiva Tattva at least once a year. For this purpose, knowledgeable people observe Shivaratri along with others and explain the concept of Shiva Tattva so that all can revel in that knowledge through the night-long celebrations once a year. This production is our offering to reach out and understand the divinity called Shiva and Shivaratri all through the year. So what is this Tattva called the Shiva Tattva and where on earth or this universe is this Shiva? The whole concept of Shiva is sublime. Our ancients have dived into the sublimity and have divined the divinity of Shiva, the embodiment of this whole universe. What they have divined as the nature, the tattva of Shiva, they have expressed in three states. Arupa, without form, 
Rupa Rupa, the formless form and Sarupa with form. The Arupa state is where there is no form, shape or color. For us to describe anything in a form that can be visualized by the mind, three aspects or dimensions are required. Time, space, matter. The Arupa stage has no form, shape or color, implying there was no space, no time and no matter to describe the Arupa state. Such a state is possible only when this universe has not yet been created. Any state to be understood must have three dimensions. The dimensions of space, time and matter. That ultimate state from which the dimensions of space and time emerge cannot come within our comprehensions. Hence it is considered to be or it can be presented only in that Arupa state. Hence Shiva, the ultimate cause, the supreme source is conceived in Arupa state and it is never brought within the realm of knowledge. The Arupa state is of that state prior to the creation of the universe. This is beautifully brought out by the Taitriya Upanishad of Yajurveda. Meaning that from which both speech and thought return without being able to understand or fathom it. That is, that which cannot be described or even imagined. The Arupa state of Shiva is the state of Shiva which is beyond manifestation. In this state, the following six attributes do not apply. Adi, Antam, Beginning and End, Sankocha, Vistara, Contraction, and expansion, prasarana, vikirana, radiation and non-radiation. All these six characteristics are applicable only for prakriti or the manifested creation. The arupa state is thus said to denote Shiva as Chaitanya or pure consciousness which does not have any of the six distortions. Hence the name Nirakara no shape, nirupa, no form, niramaya, unimaginable, nirguna, no characteristic, nirvisesha, no attributes, is attributed to Chaitanya or Shiva. This Arupa state is the source of all creation and all divinities owe their origin to the state. Hence the name Mahadeva, the source of all divinities. The Rupa Arupa state is that of the formless manifesting into the form or form emerging from the formless. This is a transitional state of sukshma to stula or subtle to gross. It is a state where the universe is getting ready to be created. In this state there is no form as such but it is conceivable in a subtler form hence presented as Rupa Arupa state. The Rig Veda line states Na asadasi no sadasi tadanim Neither was there non-existent nor existent. Unless something can be accounted for or proposed, the rejection of existent being there or non-existent being there cannot be proposed. Neither Sat nor Asat were existent at that time. There was no existent, nor was there non-existent. This state has been depicted in the form of a Barna Linga or a plain Linga at Kashi, also called Varanasi. This Linga is popularly known by the name Kashi Vishwanatha. Kashi means to shine or glow. Vishwanatha means the Lord of the Universe. Let us see how Kashi and the deity at Kashi represent the state of Rupa Rupa. Sankalpa is an age-old Indian custom of reciting and recording the time, date and venue of the day before starting any activity. Even today, 
when such sankalpa is performed at kashi the venue kashi in the sankalpa is referred to as kashyam mahasmashane anandavane asi varaneyo madhye all this go to further emphasize the concept of pralaya and regeneration and its association with shiva the potential to manifest hence kashi from time immemorial has been associated with the state of regeneration or the state prior to creation this is also brought out by visalakshi the consort of lord vishwanatha at kashi akshi is eyes and vishalam means wide visalakshi is one who bestows upon us the wide vision and understanding to visualize vishwanatha or this process of the creation of this universe from the sukshma to the sthula state that is from the subtle to the gross through kashi the shining light dawns on us on the understanding of div or the divinity in this rupa rupa state it emphasizes how shiva is the potential for life generation When Shiva manifests himself into multifarious forms the ancient texts of India call it the sarupa state sa meaning with or accompanied by and rupa means form thus sarupa means with form or manifested state this sarupa is not to be confused with swarupa swarupa means form of the self or simply form of anything Sarupa thus is a state of being while Swarupa is the form of the being The Sarupa state has eight manifestations in the forms of bhava existing sarva auspicious ishana controller pashupati lord of all beings rudra terrific or super Ugra terrifying Bhima strong Mahat all pervading These eight names of Ashtanamavali are further subdivided into Ashta Ashta that is 8 times 8 equaling 64 attributes of Shiva One of the popular forms of worshiping Shiva is through a lingam. What is this lingam? As per Yoga Shika Upanishad, the word lingam comes from the words linam and gamayati, meaning that within which the objects are merged or undifferentiated. That is, one object means or represents the other. So lingam means a mark that which leads one to infer something this aspect of a lingam as a mark to infer something has a multidimensional perspective when a baby is just born the way to identify whether it's a male or a female is through the male genital organ it is as old as nature itself it is the mark of a man as it is a mark of identifying a male the word lingam is the word used for the male genital part since the concept of a shivalingam is also a mark the shivalingam in the last 300 years has been unfortunately categorized as only being a phallic emblem by the european colonial historians who came to india what is a shivalingam a mark of then to see this we will go to a beautiful story in the shiva purana Immediately on creation the creator Brahma has a question as to how this creation happened Brahma asks this question of Vishnu from whose navel Brahma himself originated Vishnu answered I am thy father Brahma was not satisfied with the answer and a volley of questions and answers ensued between the two of them which led to a display of their respective powers 
At that time, Vishnu and Brahma spotted a third entity apart from themselves, which was a column of fire. The two, Brahma and Vishnu, wanted to find out as to what this column of fire was. Brahma flew towards one end to search for its origin, while Vishnu penetrated towards the other end, taking the form of Varaha, the bow, to bow to its other depths. In their search, both could not reach the two ends of this column, and the story in the Shiva Purana goes that they both came back to where they started from with the realization that this prapancha had expanded almost instantaneously from the most minuscule size to universal in magnitude. This fact of the story is now borne out in the scientific understanding that this universe instantaneously on the Big Bang expanded to a universal size beyond measure. This column of fire is considered as the first manifestation of Shiva at the instant of creation and the Shiva Lingam is a mark from this event. This story of the event of creation has been beautifully brought out through the sculpture of Lingod Bhava. While all this could be an explanation of a Puranic story, you may be curious to know if there is a real Shivalinga from ancient times. The earliest Shivalingam that has been archaeologically excavated and dated seems to be from the Harappa Mohanjadaro sites of the Sindhu Saraswati civilization of the period 3000 BCE or before. This area in the northwestern part of India where the Sindhu Saraswati civilization flourished about 5000 years ago is also the same geographical region described in the historic epic Mahabharata. Of the historical characters of the Mahabharata text, the prominent one of them being Arjuna, propitiated to Shiva for his boons. This archaeological find of that region and the literary details of Shivalinga worship of that period tally well. Here, archaeological finds meet literary history and bring forth clearly to us that the worship of the Tattva of Shiva through the Shivalinga has been a continuous practice of this land for well over 5,000 years and more. Ramayana is another historical epic of India and deals with the life and events of one of the most popular kings of the land, namely Ram. In this epic, Ravana, who abducted Sita, Rama's wife, and whom Rama fought and killed in a fierce battle, was the king of Lanka. This Ravana, despite his one unlawful act of abducting Sita, was a well-read scholar and a good king for his subjects. He was a great devotee of Shiva and had built a number of temples for Shiva in Lanka and consecrated Linga in them. This implies that Shiva must already have been a very established and popular divinity even before the times of Rama. Similarly, the famous Rameshwaram temple in South India and the Shivalingam there, Ramalingam, is also set to date back to the period of Rama and Ramayana. Using an integrated approach of correlating literary records with geography, marine archaeology and archaeoastronomy, a new field of science, we have now been able to place Ramayana at 5114 BCE, that is over 7000 years ago. Thus, the worship of Shiva and that too in the form of Lingam could well be bracketed with some of the longest continuous unbroken practices of this globe going back to well over 8000 years ago. The story of the Lingod Bhava and the column of fire that manifested during creation also finds expression through the form of the 12 Jyotir Lingam spread all over India even to this date. It is believed that Shiva first manifested himself as a Jyotir Lingam on the night of the Arudra Nakshatra and thus the special reverence for the Arudra star in the form of a festival called Arudra. What a beautiful connection we see here between cosmology, science, religion and the festivals of India. Having understood the universal and natural concept 
of Shiva Lingam, let us see what the different names of Shiva really denote to make this understanding even more complete. We will start with Om Karnath. Om Karnath means the Lord of Omkara, the Lord of the source of Om. Why is Shiva called Om Karnath? What is this Om? Is it a religious mark, a symbol of Hindu religion? Why is Shiva associated with Om? When the Srishti, creation, came to be, Hiranyagarbha, the cosmic egg, broke open with a big bang, Brahmanda Viswotak. This sound of the Big Bang of Brahmanda Visfuta has been reverberating and echoing back and forth since then, through the universe till date, and shall continue to reverberate till the Mahapralaya, the dissolution of this universe. Om is the echo of this Big Bang. It is called the primordial sound. Creation is said to have begun with this sound. As we have already seen, this process of creation is intrinsically linked with the concept of Shiva, who is the potential for creation, right from the Arupa state onwards. The sound that emanates from this creation is but naturally also his form. Thus, Omkarnath is an attribute of Shiva that denotes this concept of cosmic sound, its medium and its waveform and is commemorated by the Omkarishwar temple. This sound Om or the symbol is not just a symbol of the Hindu religion or of the people of India or of the people of this world or the solar system or this galaxy. It is the sound, a phenomenon of the Big Bang of this whole universe. It is much akin to the phenomenon of Shiva himself who is a universal phenomenon. Rudra is one of the popular forms in which Shiva is worshipped. The word Rudra has been translated by some colonial historians as a howler. Etymologically, if you look at the word Rudra, Ru stands for to scream, to howl and Dru to run, to move. It is from the root Ru that we have words such as Rudali in Hindi. For the one who screams and sings morning songs or even rude in the English language for hurtful words and sounds. The root dr, meaning moving, also gives rise to words such as dravya, meaning liquid or that which flows. Thus rudra is that which is continuously moving and screaming and making a howling noise. What in this universe is continuously sweeping across this universe making a howling noise, heard by the human ear or not. From modern science, today we know that the space in the universe contains various particles which are in continuous motion and form the interstellar matter. It is this spread of particles in space that leads to further creation and regeneration of matter. It is the continuous spread of these particles in space that allows for the various objects in space to connect with one another and can in one sense be called the body or fabric of the cosmos or creation. The winds caused by the movement of these particles are not our earthly winds but cosmic winds. These cosmic winds cannot be felt by our five senses nor can their sound be heard by human ears. But all the same, these sweeping and moving cosmic winds make their own howling sound all through the expanse of the universe. Thus, with Shiva being the potential to manifest, Rudra is that attribute of Shiva which continuously sweeps through the universe and thus keeps the cycle of manifestation and regeneration going on. The term Rudra is often equated with terrific. Let us understand the term terrific. It means huge, tremendous, awesome, enormous, powerful. The immenseness of this cosmic winds that sweep through the vastness of this entire universe is terrific in many a sense of this word. Rudra is thus a terrific phenomenon that is universal, cosmic 
and great in magnitude. It is the very essence of material manifestation and regeneration. There seems to be a very interesting connection between Rudra and Rudraksha. This seems to be reason why people wear a Rudraksha. Rudraksha is worn for channelizing Rudra into one's being. Aksha means I. Akarshana is to attract. Thus, Rudraksha is that which is capable of seeing and attracting the Rudra winds and particles, moving in the cosmos and to channelize them through our body. It is like an antenna. Perhaps this is why the Rudraksha is typically worn at the base of the neck as this region divides flow in the body into four different directions. Upwards to the brain, downwards to the trunk and sideways to the two arms. Your question will now be, is this something that our ancients just believed in or is there some science to it? While the thought of the Rudraksha as an antenna, a receptacle for cosmic energies to flow into the body on which it is worn may seem a bit far-fetched here is something very interesting that provides us a clue to pursue further. Hans Jenny, a Swiss scientist who lived between 1904 and 1972, had done work in the field of chymatics, that is, waves. The Greek word chyma means waves. During one of his experiments, he found that the effect of sound waves on loose particles created globules in the medium. Jenny gave us a visual description from photography of how the sand particles collect themselves when pounded with sound waves. To our amazement, when we saw the picture of the globules, it brought to fore the similarity in shape and texture between Rudraksha and these globules. Om Namo Bhagavate Rudraya Om Namaste Rudra Manyava Utota Ishave Namaha Namaste Astudhanvane Bahu Bhyam Utate Namaha Yata Ishu Shivatamash Our body, as all astral bodies, has also been called Rudra Bhumi as it moves and makes sound in the process. Adi Shankara, a famous saint of India and a highly realized soul, who lived around 480 BCE, had this to say therefore, Na Rudram Rudram Archayet. Without this humanly body Rudram and its understanding, we cannot understand that cosmic body Rudram. It is only with this human body and the understanding of it, can we in this human body understand the body of the universe and the forces in it. We understand from our ancients that the microcosm of our body is linked to the macrocosm of the universal body. Yatapinde, tata brahmande. As is the body, so is the universe. Rudra thus forms the link to the cosmos from the human self. Another popular form of Shiva is Nataraja. You may wonder as to why Nataraja is always shown as a dancing figure. Natana or Natya means dance and Raja is king. Nataraja is the lord of dance. This concept of Nataraja is more popular in South India. The dance form of Nataraja is called Tandava Nritya and it is from this dance that the dance forms of India have drawn inspiration. There are many types of Tandavan Nritya, the prominent ones being Ananda Tandavam or blissful dance and Rudra Tandavam or a fierce dance. <laughs> Shiva, 
Shiva is a universal phenomenon, a formless form Mahadeva, a cosmic form Vishwanatha, and the body of the cosmos Rudra itself. His dance has therefore got to be nothing but the dance of the cosmos itself. The Tandava Nritya is thus a cosmic dance, a dance of the cosmos. When the cosmos is about to be created, we have Nataraja performing the Rudra Tandavam. Once the universe is cooled and there is some peace, the dance of Nataraja is called Ananda Tandavam. This dance form of Shiva has been brought out in iconography. The dance form of Shiva in this icon has an outer ring which is shown with tongues of flames emerging from it, called the Jwala Prabha or disk of fire. The Nataraja form is a fine blend of artistry, geometry, cosmology and absolute reality in a balanced manner. The figurine itself has one leg raised and the other resting on a human figure. It has been best brought out in iconography of the Chola bronzes in the last thousand years. Have you noticed the form at the feet of Nataraja? Do you know why Nataraja is dancing on it? The form at the feet of Nataraja is not a child, but an Asura. This Asura has a name. He is known as Apasmara, meaning ego, conceit. This Apasmara Asura at the feet of Nataraja represents man's ego, which has to be constantly kept under check. The term Asura should not be loosely understood as a demon, as is being ascribed in the modern English language. Asura also means one who is strong and one who uses his powers forcefully for selfish needs. This depiction is considered to be symbolic of keeping one's ego under check because man, however strong, is no match for the cosmic rhythm and will be crushed in the flow of the cosmic forces. Ego is also a roadblock in the path to knowledge. Learning can only start with an awareness and acceptance of ignorance. It is sad that a few have not understood the splendor, the grandeur of what Nataraja stands for and have criticized that he is trodding on, dancing on a child. This realization and understanding is what Ananda Tandavanritya of Nataraja is expected to convey to those who see this idol and are willing to reflect on it. With one leg raised and balancing on the other, Nataraja in his dance pose highlights the importance of striking a fine balance between various traits, relationships and needs in our lives. In the last few decades, as physics and the understanding of the cosmos have made rapid strides in the international scene, many international thinkers and physicists have started looking seriously at Eastern knowledge, particularly the Indian knowledge, and have been amazed to see the correlations that have been brought about in the Indian knowledge of Shiva, Nataraja and the cosmos. Many physicists have understood it in the right light, twinning Indian perspectives with modern science. Fritjof Capra, an Austrian physicist, looked at the East for parallel knowledge. He brought out his findings in a book called The Tao of Physics, which is an exploration between parallels in modern physics and Eastern mysticism. In this, he calls the dance of Nataraja as a metaphor for the dance of the subatomic matter. He further calls it a profound representation which unifies ancient mythology, religious art and modern physics. In his words, the dance of Shiva is the dancing universe, the ceaseless flow of energy going through an infinite variety of patterns that melt into one another. For a modern physicist, the dance of Shiva is the dance of subatomic matter. As we start to understand the concept of Shiva Tattva as a universal phenomenon, we realize that it is a cosmological concept, abstract, subtle, sukshma. With the aim of making it easier for us to relate to and to indicate to us 
that we have to elevate our minds to a subtle state to understand Shiva and to also re-emphasize the presence of Shiva in all bodies including humans, Shiva is depicted as Shankara, a meditating human form. The word Shankara comes etymologically from Sham Karoti Iti Shankara, meaning that which does good. Shankara. There are various symbols associated with the divinities in the Indian pantheon. These symbols tell a story of their own and remind us of the attributes and nature of these various divinities. Shiva thus is represented with a trident in his hand called the Trishul. What does this signify? The Trishul of Shiva tells us that there are three forces, the Trinity, working together in tandem, aiding one another to keep the cycles of creation and dissolution of this universe going. The Trishul reminds us of the three states of Shiva, Arupa, Rupa Arupa and Sarupa. The Trishul also shows how the different rupa or forms of Shiva can be realized through our three modes of actions. Kaika, physical movements and senses for sarupa or the manifested form. Vachika, speech for the rupa rupa or formless form. Manasika or mind for the rupa or the formless. The Trishul pierces through these three layers, thus unraveling the layers of meaning behind Shiva. It's not just a war equipment. It is an implement that opens up our understanding of Shiva. It is pertinent to note here that the ancient Greek divinity Poseidon also has a trident in his hand. Yet another Greek divinity Dionysus also wields a trident and it is a matter of interest and a matter of intrigue indeed to notice the similarity between Dionysus and Shiva. Dionysus is encircled by a snake, has a leopard by his side, a moon in the background and has an abode on Mount Olympus. Shiva has a snake around his neck, wears leopard skin, has a crescent moon on his head and has an abode on Mount Kailash. Both wield the trident. Damru, which is another implement of Shiva, which is the primeval drum, represents the rhythmic beat of this universe. As Shiva oversees this rhythmic cycle of dissolution and regeneration, the Damru best represents this role of Shiva in keeping up this rhythm. This concept of maintaining the rhythm of the universe is brought out in the verse of the Taitri Upanishad. Ritam Vadishyami, Satyam Vadishyami, meaning I speak of the natural rhythm of this universe, which is the truth. The beat of this Damru is such that it not only creates a rhythm or a tala, it also causes a layam or a feeling of unison. The cosmic rhythmic beat is such that it causes everything in this universe to merge in unison with this beat and dissolve back into Shiva. This event is therefore called Pralayam. Thus, when Shiva beats his Damru, he causes the Pralaya or natural dissolution of this universe. Modern physiology indicates the presence of a gland called the pineal gland in the brain. The exact location of this gland has not yet been discovered. It is supposed to be in the brain behind and between the eyebrows and is considered to be the focal point for concentration. The third eye of Shiva is also but a way to remind us to open our eyes to understand and see Shiva in all the three states. The third eye is to realize Shiva 
in his formless arupa state which is at once vast terrific and terrifying Om. त्रिदलम त्रिगुणाकारम त्रिनेत्रं छत्रजायुतम त्रिजन्मपापसंहारम एकबिल्वम शिवार्पणम Every Shiva temple has a nandi a bull at its entrance and people pay respects to this nandi before entering the temple ever wondered why nandi or a bull is called rishabha in sanskrit and it is a pashu the loose translation for pashu is animal but pashu is an encompassing term that includes all living beings or bodily forms we have just seen how shiva as a principle of the universe can only be realized through subtler means and not in a physical or gross form pashu or bodily forms are stumbling blocks in the way towards realizing shiva only when one is willing to go beyond the bodily level of understanding and hones the subtler senses can one understand and realize shiva shankar and peacefulness hence it is but natural for shiva to have for his mount nandi a rishabha a pashu to signify the conquest over the mind and the body even today it is perhaps this understanding which has prompted the ancients to coin a colloquial usage phrase don't be like a nandi in a shiva temple to mean don't be an obstacle nandi is always found in front of the entrance to the temple to remind people to shed their physical thoughts and tune to subtlety while going in to pray to shiva but nandi is considered to be a support to shiva as the commander in chief of his army what does this imply While Nandi denotes the natural physical body which needs to be tuned with the mind once this union is reached then this very same body acts as a support through which the bliss of realization can be experienced Nandi then becomes the stage and Shiva is then set to dance between the horns of the Nandi Most people therefore often bend down and try to view the idol of Shiva from between the horns of the Nandi more as a protocol little realizing the profound thought behind the symbolism similar is the case with the vahana concept for the pantheon of other divinities in the indian thought where they denote obstacles that need to be conquered or support that aid in realizing that divinity these we shall deal with in depth in our future works we shall now see the matter locks of shiva in every human the dead hair on the head are continuously shed and new ones grow these dead hair fall off when we comb our hair when one does not comb their hair regularly these dead hair form locks and the head is said to bear jatta or matted locks shiva as we have seen is the principle of dissolution and regeneration not just of man or earth but of the entire universe and creation in this universe astral bodies continuously die down and new ones are formed in cycles thus the body of the universe rudra keeps accumulating dead bodies and skeletal remains of the universe the matted deadlocks of shiva is a metaphorical depiction of this physical fact of the universe as also the fact that everything in this universe is so tightly intertwined as matter locks the moon weaves a magic in the sky every fortnight once the new moon phase is reached there is no moon visible from the earth from there it goes on to grow and recreate a full moon once again within the next fortnight as part of a beautiful celestial show of nature shiva as the divinity for regeneration in his pictorial form has a very thin crescent moon on his head this symbolically depicts the regeneration aspect in the monthly cycle of the moon from the remnants of the previous cycle regeneration is connected with fertility and what is very interesting to note here 
is that in humans, the women's fertility cycle of 28-day period exactly coincides with the 28-day regenerative cycle of the moon too. The Chandrasekhara or Somasekhara form of Shiva brings out to us the intrinsic correlation between the faces of the moon and the humans. A popular story around Shiva is a story of how Ganga was brought to these lands with the effort of Bhagiratha. The river Ganga flowed from the heavens onto Shiva's head, was strapped in his matted locks and released by Bhagiratha to flow in the plains. While this is a coherent and interesting legend of kings and divinities, it is also the narration of how the release of Ganga was a river engineering feat of Bhagiratha. It talks of how Bhagiratha Prayatna is a chronicle of an extraordinary historical event highlighting the engineering skills and determination of the people of a bygone era. Ganga, Bhagiratha Prayatna, the import of it being that Ganga is a man-made river, a river engineering marvel we shall see in another production of our Bharat Gyan series. Ardhanari brings to our understanding the concept of Shakti as an equal half of Shiva. Shakti is that trigger, the energy that causes Shiva, the potential, to manifest as creation and life. Shakti is thus the complement of Shiva and without these two acting together, the cycles of creation and regeneration are not possible. Such a concept of the fusion of two giving rise to life is reflected even in the basic building block of every life form, namely the DNA. A double helical strand of genes containing all the essentials for shaping life. Many of us would have noticed small stone idols of double helical intertwined snakes under trees in temples and villages in India. It is interesting to note that there is an age-old custom in India where people pray to this idol of a double helical snake in order to beget a child. A practice that seems to tally with the Indian view and understanding of Shiva and Shakti and their roles in creation, procreation and recreation. In the traditional parlance, Shiva is considered as a great teacher which has been symbolized as the famous Dakshinamurti form. Dakshinamurti is depicted as a young knowledge giver while the four rishi who received this knowledge from him are older in age. The four rishi ask their questions in silence and receive their answers in the same mode, in silence. This brings forth to us that subtle knowledge cannot be expressed in words but is imparted to the knowledge seeker in subtler meditative forms. This legend of Dakshinamurti also highlights that age is not a barrier for knowledge dissemination and oral communication is not the only method. Just as Ardhanari is a representation of Shiva in the form of half man and a half woman, another popular form of Shiva is a representation of Shiva with Narayana. This form is called Shankar Narayana or Harihara, where Hari means Narayana and Hara stands for Shiva. The form of Shankar Narayana emphasizes the intricate relationship between sustenance and regeneration. It shows how these two are so intertwined and interdependent because without regeneration and recycling, there can be no sustainability. Quite often in the context of Indian knowledge, we hear the term Panchabhuta. Pancha means five and Bhuta are the primordial elements that form the building blocks for the universe. The Veda and the Upanishad clearly mention the five primordial elements. Akasha, space. Vayu, wind. Agni, fire. Apaha, water. Prithvi, earth. Since the universe is made up of these five primordial elements and everything in this universe emanates from them, the universe is also aptly called prapancha meaning that everything in the universe is made up from these five elements. 
to keep reminding man of these five elements and the roles they play as the building blocks of srishti or creation, temples commemorating these five elements have been built. We have Chidambaram representing Akasha, space. Sri Kalahastinya Tirupati representing Vayu, wind. Tiruvannamalai for Agni, fire. Tiruvane Kaval in Tirichi for Apaha, water. Ekambareshwar in Kanchipuram for Prithvi, earth. We on earth can understand Shiva in the five elements through our five senses of hearing, touch, seeing, tasting and smelling. Before creation of the universe, in the Hiranyagarbha, these five primordial elements are aggregated in one place. Shiva in this state is known as Maheshwara, the formless form, the transitional state between subtle and gross. This Maheshwara is envisioned in the form of a dimensionless dot or bindu. This is a very profound thought and may even be beyond a common man's understanding. It is therefore very interesting to see how it was brought down to the level of understanding on a daily basis. In our work on creation, Srishti Vigyana, we have also seen that the Hiranyagarbha or the cosmic egg, where all these five primordial elements were present together and from which the universe emerged, is equated with a dot Bindu. Our ancients had brought the macrocosm into our microcosm through a beautiful sublime design. We have already seen that the body is called Rudra. In our body there is the spot between the eyebrows, a point where we bring together all of our attention and senses. This spot is also called the Bindu. This Bindu on the body of a man where the five senses are gathered and focused has been equated with the Hiranyagarbha or cosmic egg. This Hiranyagarbha has the five primordial elements, the Panchabhuta, together. With this Bindu, our ancients have linked the macrocosm of the cosmic egg, the Hiranyagarbha, with the microcosm of our body, the Rudra. Beyond this, everything dissolves into Nada, the primordial waves as a liar, and merges finally into Sadashiva, the formless, an indescribable eternal joy and happiness. The ultimate formless truth that cannot be seen or described. Sada means eternal. Sadashiva, the eternal one that keeps the cycle of the manifestation of the universe and everything in it going again and again. The eternal ultimate truth to be realized. Sadashiva is never created nor destroyed. He is eternal, always existing. Even at the end of the universe or dissolution, Sadashiva continues to exist to carry on with the regeneration of the next cycle of creation. This manifested universe that we live in goes through various states during its lifespan. Each state has a scientific name such as Shiva, Maheshwara, Rudra, Nataraja, Kala, Bhairava to Bhuvaneshwar. All these come from that one single regenerative principle, the eternal principle, Sadashiva. Shiva has been commonly associated with death and destruction. Shiva as Rudra has even been branded as an angry and fierce divinity. What we have seen so far shows that Shiva is not just the Lord of Destruction, but is in fact the Lord of the whole generative and regenerative principle of the universe. For regeneration to happen, what is there has to come to an end first for it to be regenerated. For example, only when the flower withers do we get fruit. The fruit gives way for seeds to come out. Only when the seed breaks open can the new plant germinate 
to give us more flowers and fruits once again. Even in the world of artificial things, old broken plastic containers need to be destroyed and melted to be recycled and molded as new containers once again. Without destruction or change, there can be no regeneration. This whole universe undergoes continuous cyclical changes of creation, life, destruction and regeneration. This is the very purpose and principle of nature and this universe. It is to bring out this principle of nature and to bring out the regenerative forces of nature that Shiva has been in some forms personified as a wrathful and destructive divinity. So contrary to Shiva being the angry divinity in the process of regeneration, Shiva is the potential to manifest everything in this universe and is therefore considered auspicious. We find that Shiva and the multitude of names, forms and attributes are but a way of explaining the cosmic phenomena of creation, dissolution and regeneration. Change is the only constant factor in the universe. Change can happen in two ways, one through a violent changeover and the other through celebration. Once we realize this along with the traditional concept of pralaya, which is an acknowledgement of change, then this change can come about through celebration. Shivaratri is the time for readying ourselves for the change, celebrating the anticipated change and thus celebrating Shiva. The formless and the indescribable which is the cause for the creation of the universe, the rhythmic functioning and regeneration of the universe is a universal nature of nature itself. This truth, which is the ultimate truth, is Satyam. Life is a holistic part of this truth and helps us to realize this absolute truth and the auspiciousness in it. This realization and the unification with the truth is Shivam. When we understand this truth through the realization of ourselves and our innate bond with this truth, we can see the beauty in our lives, nature and the natural design in this very creation and truth itself. This beauty is Sundara. It is the simple yet profound knowledge that lies within the popular phrase Satyam Shivam Sundaram. After seeing the multidimensional aspects of Shiva, we are now ready for embarking on each of our subtle journeys to understand and celebrate Shiva in all the truly universal forms and formlessness of Shiva. Where your earlier understanding of Shiva ended, may this journey begin. Shivaste Pantanaha. May your ways be auspicious. Aham Nirvikalpo Nirakara Rupa Vibhur Vyapya Sarvatra Sarvi